So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, delighted to be with you. I'm James Salter with a company called Atlantic Engineering. Uh, I've been to this conference before, and I'm a real fish out of water here because I'm not a policy guy. At the end of the day, I'm just a contractor. And uh, the only value that I really bring uh, to a group of intellectuals like this uh, is that we've done a fair amount of um, fiber work around the country and seen some things that work and some things that don't. So I'm supposed to talk to you about community broadband networks. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk to you about an idea. And uh, <clears throat> I need help developing this idea because I think it's a good idea. Uh, and nobody has any interest in it, and I think it could materially impact uh, broadband deployment in America. So, uh, without further ado, um, we've been around the, we're sort of fiber to the home guys. Uh, we've been around since the beginning. Uh, we take credit for building the first citywide fiber uh, deployment in America in uh, Kutztown, Pennsylvania, about 12 years ago. Uh, and um, over that 12 years, we've been involved in 30-something citywide builds, uh, most of them for the municipality itself, but some of them for folks like Google, uh, where we're their prime contractor designing and building Kansas City. Uh, these are those 32 communities around the country. Uh, we're an Atlanta-based company, so uh, we like working close to home, but we've branched out following the market uh, all around the country. So, and for those of you that have met uh, us and me, uh, we've been pretty vocal about things through the years uh, to the point where uh, occasionally I'm thought of as a buffoon in the industry and uh, I'm willing to take that risk because in fact I am a buffoon. And, and so over the last 12 to 15 years we've had uh, four ideas that we've brought up uh, all of which at the time we brought them up had a relative uh, bit of controversy to them and that they don't seem so controversial now. So I'm, I'm introducing these four to set up the fifth idea, which is what I really want to talk about. So the four ideas that we've, <clears throat> I don't think we take uh, credit for them being original, but uh, we preach to the market the demand for bandwidth won't end. That seems like a foregone conclusion right now, but I saw an article in the Kansas City Star yesterday uh, where Tom Warner says, what does anybody want a gig for? So I'm not sure that argument is put, put to bed. Uh, we, we argued through the years that fiber is the only answer to bandwidth, that wireless won't do it, uh, that coax won't do it, that copper won't do it, and I've taken a, a lot of heat for that, uh, particularly from wireless guys and coax guys and copper guys, uh, but we do stand by that, and I think uh, most of this room would agree that if we want big bandwidth, we want fiber. Uh, through the years, uh, we've preached that if a community believes they need bandwidth, they ought to consider doing it themselves. Uh, and 32 of them at least have done that, uh, and uh, uh, all 32 of them are still in business. Uh, they've had mixed results. There's been some uh, financial winners and some financial hardships and some people that have become heroes and some people that have become goats. Uh, but in fact, all 32 of those communities are better served uh, for having made that decision. Uh, the most controversial stance we ever took, uh, and it probably would be pretty controversial in this room, is that we preached early on that we don't believe open access in the, in the U.S. model uh, works. And uh, the U.S. model is let's, uh, uh, let's borrow money to build a network, make it available to everybody, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of people will want it, and we'll be able to pay back our money. Uh, that hadn't worked. The poster child of that disaster is utopia. Uh, and even though even now we're dancing around whether it is a disaster, it is. And it's because the model's broken. Uh, the European model for that is let's let the government uh, uh, buy the cost of the network. Uh, that makes open access work, but you have to have uh, some kind of impetus to, to, to make the CapEx happen uh, or uh, it's a difficult model to, to bring forward. So those are the ideas we put in the market in the last 15 years. Uh, here's, here's the fifth idea. So if you look at uh, fiber to the home today in America, uh, about 15% of America is built with it, and 12% you know, of that 15% is Verizon. And uh, 
Uh, kudos to Verizon for what they've done over the last uh, eight years or so uh, building fiber, and I, uh, they've certainly brought it to a lot of folks, but they've brought it essentially to high-density uh, urban, um, um, you know, s some people would say rich uh, areas, and uh, that's good, and that's the right business plan for them, uh, but America's 15% built with fiber. Uh, I believe, and maybe some of y'all believe, that, uh, the, that we ought to have uh, this high uh, availability of bandwidth uh, to all of America. So if you believe that, I've thought a lot about how, how can we make that happen? How can you really make that happen? Well, one way you can make it happen is, uh, you know, let the government subsidize it. So rural America can't afford to build it themselves. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's get Connect America Fund or Universal Service Fund or whatever kind of subsidy you want to call it. Uh, that's one way to make it happen, and that, that's an appropriate way uh, to help make it happen. Uh, but this is the way I think you can do it standalone. And uh, I want to talk about that just briefly, and I want you all to help me develop this idea. So uh, I think that the guys that ought to build America, the rest of America, uh, are electric utilities. Now, they can either build it themselves uh, or they can partner with somebody to do it, uh, but they are in the best position to make it happen. So uh, we're going to build on that here in a second. First of all, let me show you uh, my home. This is literally, I live in rural America. Uh, I own a company that's in Atlanta, and uh, my house is 100 miles from Atlanta, and there's the view off my back deck. And uh, I love living in rural America. It's hard to do business in rural America. Um, if you if you do a uh, I'm a I'm a product of Windstream. Uh, here is my uh, 89.95 a month Windstream service at my house with the 700k downstream, and I'm uh, really pushing to get 100k upstream. And America needs to be built. By the way, uh, I'm really cautious about. Uh, uh, talking about anything relative to our engagement with Google because I'm supposed to be cautious about that. Uh, but I, I'm going to say two things about it today. Uh, one, I, I'm the prime contractor, and, when, and the outside plant uh, portion of a build is 50 to 60 percent of the overall cost of a build. And recently, uh, I've been reading all of these uh, uh, blogs that seem to be taking a life of their own uh, that, you know, Google's cost is outlandish, uh, that it's 6000 to $8,000 a home passed. Oh, I'll just say this, I'm not speaking on behalf of Google, but I'm doing something wrong in my negotiations with them because if it was 6000 to $8,000 a home passed, I ought to be living here <laughs> rather than <laughs> in rural America where I do live. So why do I think you, you, electric utilities are the answer? Well, there's maybe three reasons. One, I, I think the, the ILEX and the MSOs are kind of done with uh, fiber to the home. Uh, ILEX are, are wireless uh, focused as they should be. Uh, that's where their profits are. Uh, MSOs are you know, slow to move into the 21st century. Uh, they, they still think DOCSIS is the answer to big bandwidth. Uh, so uh, I, I think they're kind of done uh, the absolute biggest hurdle uh, to building fiber of the home, bar none, is uh, access to easements. So, uh, and, and this is the second thing I'm going to say about Google. Uh, if you look at the 32 builds that we've done around the country, six of them were for, and the ones that highlighted in yellow there, were for people that didn't own the poles in the town. Uh, and... 26 of them were for municipal utilities or independent telcos that did own the poles and have easy access. And I can tell you without question, all six of those, the ones that didn't have easements, the schedule to get it built and the cost to get it built is significantly higher, particularly the schedule. Uh, because the guy that owns the poles is typically pretty obstructionist about you getting on his pole. Uh, but it, it, it's taken twice as long to build it because you don't have access. There's a significant added cost that makes the economics more questionable. And uh, so the, the easement uh, issue is a part of the big issue of building out America. And then the, <clears throat> the third reason I think, and the main reason I think electric utilities ought to build uh, America 
is uh, because they have, an they have an economic incentive to do it. They just hadn't figured it out yet. Uh, and that economic incentive is they eventually are going to need to do something to make their uh, networks smart. And everybody talks about smart grid. And, and if you look at smart grid in America today in electric utilities, what that means is they put a meter on the side of the house that they can remotely read. That's smart grid. Or, you know, if I had a Duke Energy or a Southern Company executive in here, he would make fun of me and say, no, son, you know, you don't have that right. We're doing a lot more than that. We're preparing. No, you're not. You're not doing anything. You, and then there's a reason for that. And uh, that reason is why all you policy guys need to help this idea along. But before we get to that reason, let's talk about utility investment per customer. So if you look at the three biggest telecom providers in America, here's what, they, here's what it costs them to build their networks per customer. So Verizon's $2,500. Comcast is more primarily because they bought a bunch of Ma and Pa cable operators and overpaid them. But still, $2,500 to $3,000 bucks a customer is the CapEx investment in telecom in America. Look at the three biggest electric utilities in America. This is their CapEx <coughs> per customer. So, in a sense, Verizon's cost uh, is a rounding error for Duke Energy, the nation's largest electric utility. They, they spend huge dollars uh, building networks to provide reliable electric service. So they're not in the telecom business. They don't really care about being in the telecom business. <clears throat> they, they care about return on investment. And if you look at that investment and how it breaks out, it's two-thirds generation. So all of these coal plants, nuclear plants, uh, wind farms, whatever, is two-thirds of the cost of your electric bill. And if you, by the way, I think this is an interesting stat, if you look at the total investment of electric utilities in America, it's about $1.75 trillion, which is about the same as our budget deficit for this year. That usually gets a laugh. This is a, this is a left-leaning group, huh? <laughs> so here's the opportunity if you look at the generation that's in America today all these 5,000 coal plants around the country and nuclear plants all that stuff adds up to about 900,000 megawatts but if you look at the usage of electricity in America and, of course, it fluctuates up and down how hot it is, what time of day it is. I'll show you a chart here in a minute. <clears throat> we only use, on average, about half of that generating capacity. So think about the wasted dollars about associated with inefficiency of electric utilities in America. The stranded CapEx dollars are its a huge number. It's enough of a number to, to change that dynamic get a communication system that can really talk to people in real time, influence people's purchasing decisions but by implementing price signals that change people's behavior and, and pay for itself, literally pay for itself. Here is your home electric usage if you're like every other American. And if you're a really you know, conservative American that drives a Prius, and, uh, and tries to do the right thing and recycles, your, your chart looks just like that, only lower. You use less, but you still use it on a, on a curve like that, on an S curve. So you, you wake up, you're not using any, uh, you peak out in the afternoon when it's really hot and the air conditioner's running, and then you fall off at night. Then that's the whole country. If we could change people's behavior to take away that peak and add in that shoulder, the, the savings associated with that for, by improving the efficiency to electric utilities would be something like $1,800 $1, a home. Well, guess what it costs to build fiber to the home? $1,800 a home. So I, I contend this crazy idea that if we'll build communication networks for the efficiency of electric utilities, partner with telecom, whatever, <laughs> that you can pay for it just on the efficiency of the electric utility and, and 
all the other stuff, like bringing you a gigabit to your home, uh, is a side uh, byproduct, a positive byproduct of that. So, <clears throat> again, this chart shows that I think that the smart grid, a real smart grid, <clears throat> is the cheapest cost of generation available in America. So, <clears throat> why this? Why anybody with me on this? Why in this room enthusiastic about it? I can tell you, you're really not. You're, you either don't believe it or don't understand it or... But, all right. But so here's why I think the electric utilities aren't with me on this. Well, the first one is huge. They don't have any regulatory incentive to do this. Utilities get paid back on capital investment. They don't get... And that means they get paid back for building that inefficient coal plant they spend a billion bucks on it, they get a guaranteed return on that billion bucks. They don't get, right now today, for smart grid and real energy efficiency things, most state regulatory uh, commissions don't give them a return on that. That's why Duke Energy, that has $100 billion worth of infrastructure, is intending to spend $1 billion on smart grid over the next seven years, and they're bragging about it. And, and I'm not picking on them. They're the same as every other electric utility in America. They're, they're, they're dabbling in it because they don't have any regulatory incentive to do it. So that's where y'all come in. We got to change that regulatory idea. They also don't think if you went to any electric utility, major electric utility today, they don't think that you need to do fiber to the home to do smart grid, that you need to do it with wireless. And they're wrong. And, and I'm going, I'm going to stick my neck out and say, and every one of them would tell me I'm crazy that it, you, you'll be fine with wireless. It's much cheaper. It's a better choice. And, and I say call Chattanooga, Tennessee, who's probably uh, in the forefront of, uh, of actually doing this. Uh, they got a grant to do it, so, uh, you know, that made their uh, business plan a little bit better. But, and, and ask them what kind of data requirements are really needed to really get real-time feedback to the refrigerator level in a home. And it's huge. It'll be the biggest data network in the world if we actually do it correctly. And then the final thing is they don't really, they don't really want to be in the, uh, the retail telecom business. It's a nuisance to them. Uh, so the, uh, we've got to convince them that uh, building fiber, because uh, they are worried about cyber security, and either partnering or getting in this business is in their long-term best interest. So there's my idea. It's, it's undeveloped. Y'all helped me develop this idea because I really believe in it, and uh, I thank you for listening to me.